While browsing through my neighborhood's Facebook page, I came across a post that put the fear of God in me. Although it may not pertain to the area you live in, I felt it wise to share anyway. In order to make the backstory as simple and brief as possible, I'll keep to the main points of the story. Around January of this year, the residents of an affluent neighborhood across town began noticing things missing from their yards. At least that's how it started. As the weeks passed, their homes started to be burglarized. One by one, street by street, the burglary spread. When April arrived, barely 1% of the homes remain untouched. Probably because most of the residents of those homes were retired and spent their days at home rather than leaving them unattended. The robberies slowed greatly but never completely stopped. Even after four months had passed, the police were no closer to finding a suspect. May was starting to look like the end of the crimes until they accelerated once again in a new neighborhood, this one just a mile from mine. While not as wealthy, these homeowners still had plenty of goodies to draw the thief or thieves to them. I say thief or thieves because at that time no one was sure how many crooks there were. Odd said it was more than one simply due to the number and speed of the crimes. Somehow, maybe because the robberies made the cops look bad, the break-ins managed to stay out of the news. One story popped up by June but was unexplainably buried deep into the back of the paper. Just as before, the thieves blew through house after house, taking anything not nailed down and got away unseen by anyone. It's often reported all it takes is for one person to notice something small to break a case wide open. It was a little old lady who noticed something strange on her street that would lead to the resolution of this one. She reported that it struck her as strange that the garbage men, who had only just picked up her trash, returned about an hour later in another truck. This time, however, they only drove up and down streets and never stopped to pick anything up. The report wasn't taken very seriously at first, but a couple of detectives decided to follow up on it. They waited until it was the regular pickup day and watched the habits of the garbage men working their route. At first, all seemed normal. However, a few hours into their stakeout, they noticed four men in a different truck turned down an alley in front of them. Continuing to watch the men, the detectives noticed the truck stop halfway down the alley and the men approached the rear of a house. This spurred their curiosity and they decided to question the men in the truck. When the men saw the detectives coming, two ran off but the other two stayed where they were. Calling for backup, the two had run off were soon picked up. All four were arrested and within hours confessed to being part of a burglary ring. They had successfully robbed over 300 homes in our city. Despite being in a different make of garbage truck, they had taken the extraordinary measures of painting the city logo on the doors of the truck just as our actual ones are. Even crazier was the four men were arrested wearing the very same uniforms our trash men wear. The authorities freely admitted that had not the nosy old woman noticed the second truck, they may not have ever caught them. Although they did catch the men, it came out soon after that the ring that they were a part of most likely spanned the entire country and are believed to have killed at least five homeowners during burglaries in other states. This is all the information we currently have and hopefully for your own sake that this group has not made it to your area and never do. Regardless if this threat exists near you, I felt it was important to pass on this story. If anything, just let you know what to look for if the burglary rate increases in your neighborhood. Not to mention, you gotta admit, this is an ingenious way to go unnoticed. Upon the death of my mother in June, I inherited my parents' house. The house has been the one I grew up in, but I hadn't visited it for some time. Since it was paid off, I saw no reason to stay in my apartment, so I moved in soon after the funeral. The house was in considerable disrepair, and I've devoted a large amount of my free time to fixing the little things I felt comfortable messing with. One major project I was not comfortable tackling was the garage door. I had it broken on my mother, and without my dad around to fix it, and no money to get it repaired, it had remained stuck open for at least the past year or more. It was going to have to stay that way until I could scrounge up the money to have a handyman look at it. 
Much worse than the state of the house is the rapid decline of the neighborhood. It's never been an upper-class area, but in the brief span of 15 years, it's degraded greatly. According to the local news, a young woman was assaulted a mere two blocks from me. If I would have known how dangerous the old neighborhood had become, I certainly wouldn't have moved in. I'm a single female myself, and this amount of crime makes me feel very unsafe. Despite my regrets, this is my home for the time being, and I have to move forward with my life. During the week, I usually leave before sunset and don't return often until after sundown. On the weekends, I try to adhere to the same schedule except instead of leaving for work around dawn, I visit the market and return before the residents can see me. This lifestyle has allowed me to exist separately from my neighbors, and that's the way I liked it. This concept of out of sight, out of mind has served me well. I'm a homebody anyway, always have been, and so I don't mind staying inside all day. Lord knows all the repairs to this place have kept me busy. My days have been like this since I moved in, but I decided to take my summer vacation last week and something terrifying happened that Monday morning. It was a peaceful one and not out of the ordinary until I noticed the screech of the garbage truck. The sound reminded me I had forgotten to put out the can for them. On my way out the door, I grabbed the bag from the kitchen. I'd been keeping the can in the garage and was about to roll it out when I noticed a flash out of the corner of my eye. Turning to get a better look, I could clearly see a raggedy man attempting to scurry away. Unfortunately for us both, I was blocking his only way through the junk and out to freedom. When it became clear to him that he couldn't escape, he stopped about six feet and peered at me with a wicked snarl on his face. He may not have known it at the time, but I didn't intend on trapping him in there. It was just that I was frozen in my spot from terror, and I couldn't move an inch. Another result of my fear was that I began yelling at him uncontrollably. Who are you? Why are you here? Both questions blurted out of my mouth before I even realized what was happening. Once I started speaking, I began taking back control of myself and yelled out at him again. What are you doing here? I could hear the fear in my voice as I said it. I suppose he heard it too because a smug little grin took the place of the sneer on his dirty mug. Are you okay, ma'am? Somehow, without either of us noticing, the garbage truck had pulled into the alleyway next to where my can usually was, and the garbage man was standing halfway up my driveway. I assumed my yelling had gotten his attention, and he had walked up to investigate. His question caused me to jump, and my fear got even worse until I turned around and saw his uniform in the truck parked behind him. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. I heard yelling and wanted to make sure everything was cool. Is it? I mean, do you know this man? Is he supposed to be on your property? I guess the look on my face betrayed my feelings. For a moment or two, we all stared at each other, unsure of what to do. Then the garbage man looked into my eyes and slowly waved me over to him. That must have been what I needed to help me move. Without a moment's hesitation, I began backing out of the garage, never taking my eyes off the man in front of me. He did the same thing. The moment I reached the garbage man, my fear started to evaporate. Now that I was safely next to him, we continued to watch the invader. It seemed now that he no longer had the advantage over me. He had become afraid. His eyes darted back and forth between the two of us until the garbage man spoke. Hey look dude, you need to get out of here and don't come back. If you do, oh, the cops will be called. Spread the word to your friends, this place is off limits from now on. What he said made me want to laugh, but at the same time I couldn't argue with the message. No sooner than he finished, the guy shot like a bullet out of the garage and down the alley. With the guy out of sight, the garbage man let out a big gasp and started chuckling. I don't know about you, but I was terrified. I had no idea what to do, I know that speech probably sounded pretty stupid, but I was flying by the seat of my pants the whole time. Are you okay? He didn't get his hands on you, did he? I was in awe. The whole time, he seemed like he was in complete control and knew just what he was doing. I'm glad he had good instincts. My adrenaline slowed down about this time and the seriousness of my predicament hit me like a truck. I buckled and fell to my knees, fighting the urge to vomit the whole time. 
He suggested I sit still with my head between my knees and breathe slowly. He obviously knew how this sounded and explained the purpose behind it. He hadn't led me astray yet, so I took the advice. I'm unsure how long we sat in my driveway talking, but it was at least an hour. The talking helped me to take my mind off the nausea. I told him a bit about what had happened and the problem with the door that caused it. When he went back to his truck, I was feeling a lot better. Upon returning to the safety of the house, I locked it down and stayed in the rest of the day and the next. Sometime after 9am, Wednesday morning, a knocking came at the front door. Reluctant at first, I eventually looked out the peephole and saw that it was the garbage man, but in normal street clothes. My run-in on Monday was still very much on my mind. Despite him being the one to help me, I still didn't open the door right away. Instead, I asked him what he wanted through the door. Uh, I'm off today, so I thought I'd come over and fix the garage door for you. If that's okay, that is. Taking a moment to think it over, I told him it was. I didn't have the money to have anyone else do it. I watched him walk around toward the back of the house, carrying a toolbox with him. It was over an hour before I got the nerve to go outside and thank him. We BS'd while he worked and by the late afternoon he had fixed it. I made him dinner as a thank you and he left just after 7. It was the least I could do. While I'm not sure where this all may lead, knowing I have a guardian angel may make living in this neighborhood a little less scary. While I was in CVS the other day picking up a prescription, I noticed the fall Thanksgiving themed things that were being stocked on the shelves. Every year around this time when I begin seeing these decorations, I'm reminded of a horrible accident I witnessed five years ago this year. Although no one I care for was injured in it, the outright shocking nature at the scene and the ultimate result to those who were indeed involved, it still never fails to cast a shadow on the season's gatherings. I'm sure I'm not the only American that finds himself buried in chores this time of year. The particular day of the wreck, I was in and out of the office all day. The minute I was finally able to dig into work, something else was needed or went wrong. I went on a return trip from Staples, taking it easy as I went because of a recent freeze combined with the automatic sprinklers made it a slippery go. The driver just in front of me had made it halfway through the intersection when... They were suddenly T-boned by a trash truck from out of nowhere. Instead of stopping right away, both vehicles continued sliding sideways until they ultimately stopped by a bank building sitting on the corner of the block. I must have stopped myself because once they finally hit the building, I noticed I wasn't moving. The wreck appeared to be moving in slow motion and seemed to have lasted several minutes, which of course it could not have. Myself and one other guy got out of our cars and ran over to help the drivers. When I reached the trash truck and opened the driver's door, both men were unconscious. The cab of the truck looked as if it was welded to the driver's side of the car. If we're ever going to get her out of the car, we were going to have to back up the truck somehow. A pair of paramedics showed up about this time. We had a quick powwow to figure out our next move. Since the fire truck still hadn't arrived, we volunteered to help them out. Although the female driving the car was conscious, a lot of blood was pouring down her face and she was very confused. We knew the longer she sat without any medical assistance, the worse she would get. A quick glance at the windshield of the truck told me nothing had changed. Neither man was awake. They could have been dead for all I knew, but I wasn't willing to wait any longer. Climbing into the cab, I pushed the driver aside and searched around until I found the ignition. To everyone's joy, the truck started. Finding the transmission took me a tad longer, but I did. It did fight me at first, but I jiggled the shifter until I got it to engage. As it slowly rolled backwards, the car's door ripped away from the body of the car, giving the paramedics the much-needed access to the driver we'd all hoped for. Happy that we'd had enough room to get her out, I killed the ignition in the truck just in time for the truck's driver to regain consciousness. The fire truck did arrive on the scene soon after, having been held up by another multi-car wreck a few blocks away. Now that the pros were all there, me and the other driver stepped aside and let them do their jobs. 
Within the hour, all drivers and passengers were on their way to the hospital, and the scene was almost completely cleaned up. Confident I wasn't going to get any more work done for the day, I headed home. I kept my eyes on the paper and TV for any news on the condition of those involved in the crash, but it wasn't until the week before Thanksgiving that I heard anything. Unfortunately, the female driver in the car died three days after. Although she was healing well and was thought to be going home soon, late one night she threw a blood clot and passed away. She was not the only one, however. The guy riding shotgun in the trash truck never regained consciousness. At some point during the course of the accident, he had a heart attack and died right there. Even though he was the one driving the truck, I don't blame or hold any ill will against the garbage man. He was just another part of many other vehicle accidents that day. I guess if I wanted to be angry at someone, I could point the finger at the businesses who run their sprinklers, even during the fall and winter, but I'm not really mad at anyone. This time of year is supposed to be about the meeting of family and all the things we have to be thankful for. Perhaps witnessing the last moments of people does cast a bit of a shadow over the season. And despite all of that, I am thankful. Had it been me struck by that truck that day, I may not have been alive to celebrate another holiday with those I love. I can't think of anything better to be thankful for. On February 24, 1999, Michael Ruiz would be accidentally killed in a fight with one of his fellow sanitation engineers outside their place of work. The death was ultimately judged as an act of self-defense. The other members involved in the altercation stated on multiple occasions that he was attacked from behind by Ruiz. The two men who witnessed the fight agreed with the defendant. One of them later said, He pounced on Tony like he was possessed by a rabid animal. I'd never seen him act that way before. Tony had no chance but to fight back. When Mike went for his eyes, it was obvious this had become a fight for his life. The evening of his death, the police carefully searched Ruiz's home, hoping to discover a motive to the attack on his co-worker. What they would discover would shed light on the inner mind of a man in the depths of psychological collapse and the events that led to it. Unknown to anyone other than the officers there that day and Ruiz himself, Tony Campbell, the defendant, had prevented a terrible act of bloodshed from happening a mere two days later. The following paragraphs come from a notebook of papers written by Ruiz. It documents the awful plan he was soon to set into action and the unfortunate events that he felt justified him to strike out against his enemies. Although a few names of people and locations may have been changed or omitted to preserve their privacy, all pertinent information surrounding the actions mentioned above have been left intact. Now I present to you all with the media entitled The Bloody Plan of Michael Ruiz and the Poor Excuses for It. My life was as average as any others, I suppose. I was boldly just like anyone else. Even though I despised it at the time, it would soon be my first lesson in the dynamics of power. It's not often discussed, but we all learn our place in the pecking order eventually. No doubt my bully had been bullied by someone else in his life. He was simply paying it forward in order for me to learn my place in life just as he had. The way in which we are reminded of our place changes as we grow. In college, the professors take the place of the bullies and use their superior position in the school to do so. Once our real life truly starts, our adult one, as long as we remain among our own people, no one should have any reason to knock us back into our place. The only part of our lives this may differ is at our workplace. They're nothing more than a more serious form of school, anyhow. Your boss should really be the one single person who can truly be in the right for correcting you. Unless, of course, he's nothing more than just another of your peers with a fancy title. At that point, he's on the same level as you and should by all rights keep his mouth shut. From the first day I learned this unfortunate lesson, I lived by this rule. I was confident that as long as I remembered my place and stayed in it for the remainder of my life, I'd have a decent one. However, on February 26th, 1998, I discovered no matter how hard I worked, loved my family, or said my prayers, I couldn't prevent the death of my daughter. 
The verdict was SIDS, Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. What kind of answer was that? It in no way tells you how she actually died. It seems to me just another way of saying, we don't know. When it happened, I was ready to end it all right then, but fortunately, I still had Heather. Everyone around us said that as long as we stuck together, we'd make it through. Time heals all wounds and the rest of that empty garbage. She didn't even wait three months before she left. Something about my suffocating grief, whatever that's supposed to mean. For the second time that year, I made the decision to check out, but the same people gave me the same platitudes. Although I have no reason to listen, I did. Some force inside me drove me forward. Perhaps I had attempted to get above my station in life and become too proud of the things I had, so I believed them when they told me to let time do its thing. It hadn't been more than five months since my life began to collapse before my co-workers began mocking me. As with the other problems, I believed this treatment to be a reminder from my peers that I had let my pride take over. Over time, though, the barbs and banter began to take a tone of vindictiveness and I took my concerns to my supervisor. Instead of the support I had expected, he made it clear that I was in some way responsible for this treatment. This is when it finally clicked in my head. It wasn't myself that had lost his way. It was those around me who had become eaten up with pride. I could see it clearly now. Fancy cars, expensive vacations to the Bahamas. We were garbage men for God's sakes. It was me who would be responsible for reminding them of how far they had strayed. The following months flew by quickly as I first formed my plan in my mind and then put it into action. Any free minute I had was used to create in my mind and then build with my hands. As the days grew closer to my deadline, I feared I wouldn't finish my work in time. But if you are reading this, I obviously have and am no longer here to suffer. If you find yourself wondering why I chose the 26th as the day to execute my plan, I figure the anniversary of the day I lost my Anita. No finer a time to remind my peers of how far they have strayed. If the two bombs I planted at the administration building have not managed to destroy some, if not all, my co-workers, my supervisors included, I am more than confident the one I planted at his home will, at least, end the life of the man who has most lost his way and was responsible for his entire path of retribution I have been forced upon. Ultimately, I am only comforted by the fact that it was me who maintained his true path in life. I pray there is a place I may be together with my Anita once more. Do not condemn me for what I've done. I have simply taken upon myself a task no others had the courage to undertake. When I stumbled upon Let's Read's channel and learned he took listeners' story submissions... I thought it would be cool to send him a few stories about some crazy things that happened to me. All of these happened to me while I worked for a large city close to where I grew up in Texas. Some are more gory than scary, but I promise everyone they are all 100% true. Well, mostly. Besides it being a subject I know a lot about, I'm writing these stories to give the world an insight to a job that most people, especially upper class ones, don't know much about. Growing up in a blue-collar family in small-town Texas gave me a positive view of hard work. Despite that, I've always had a more intellectually leaning mind. In middle school, my biggest dream was to visit Japan after graduation. By high school, I wanted to be a criminal psychologist and interview serial killers. I never ended up doing either. See, I've always been a very lazy person. Although I could do the hardest schoolwork except for math, and the calculator's always been my best friend, I usually preferred taking a nap on my desk. Because it was the easier path, I quit school my senior year and got my GED. I was going to have to slog it out at a junior college before I moved on to a university, but I didn't mind. I hated high school anyway. Two weeks later, I'd taken my money out of the college and used it to move to Austin with a few friends. I had a great time there, but because of problems I created, I was back at home by 1995. 
I continued bouncing around Texas every few years until we get to around the year 2000. Through a childhood friendship, I end up with a job working for a large Dallas suburb as a garbage man. The technical name was Sanitation Engineer, but I wasn't fooling myself. I was handling people's trash. Like I said earlier, I grew up in a working class home and I had no problem doing manual labor. The aspect of the job that had made it so appealing was the pay. Of course, I couldn't afford to live in the city I worked for, but I'd still be getting the same level of pay that had taken my father 20 years to get to, and that was just a start. This was at the time before the economy began to take a downturn. We were given full benefits and had guaranteed raises once a year. It was certainly a dirty job, but for a 20-something kid with a GED, I was ballin'. Perhaps even better was my girlfriend didn't mind. A closer description of her would be excited. After all, we were getting out of our rinky-dink town and living in the heart of one of the largest metropolitan areas in the country. Looking back on it now, life was pretty good. With all the formalities out of the way, we'll get to my first story. This initial tale takes place a few months after 9-11. In hindsight, this is about the time things began to go downhill financially for us city employees. My partner and I were working our usual route. In this particular city, we still did things the old way. We didn't pick up trash cans, but we did put bags in the back of the truck ourselves. They were supposed to stay under 50 pounds, but it was common to come across one close to 100. My three bulging discs are proof of that. I digress. Anyway, it was my turn to pull trash. At one specific stop, I picked up a bag and noticed it was full of books and videotapes. Being a book fanatic, I had to see what was in it. After I cut it open, I knew I'd hit pay dirt. A big black trash bag full of spotless goodies. In order to make a little extra money, a lot of us guys would sell any valuable items we came across on our routes. Whatever books I didn't keep for myself would go to half-price books. Before I decided on what to keep, I waved my partner to the back to choose if he wanted anything for himself. As he sifted through the bag, we began to notice a theme start to form. Almost every book had something to do with warfare or something in history connected to it. Among them was a really nice volume of The Art of War by Sun Tzu, a history of the Third Reich and the notoriously anti-Semitic fraud of a book called The Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion, a fake first published in 1903 in Russia telling of a global Jewish conspiracy to control the world through the press and other media. If this sounds familiar, it's because it's the progenitor of all the crazy global Jewish conspiracies we hear today. It was also taught in the schools of Nazi Germany, so there's that too. Although this already sounds strange, there was also multiple copies of a video with Arabic script and subtitles in English called Children of Fire. At the time, this didn't mean much. However, considering the recent attacks and the shutting down of a local charity, we were unsure if we had something connected to the two. My partner and I shared a horrific look. What did we just stumble on? I think any American could be forgiven for putting two and two together, but the fact was, we weren't supposed to be digging in the bags. It wasn't a privacy policy, more of a, you should be working not digging in the resident's trash sort of thing. Even if we had the feeling that we were throwing out these things to hide something, that was the facts. We both knew regardless of whether this was real evidence of something, if we called law enforcement, we'd get chewed out by our dim-witted bosses. After thinking about it for a moment, I decided I'd take a small selection of books and videos and hold on to them in case something occurred down the line. And that's just what I did. Now we move forward in time. And maybe a year later, or as long as two, I don't actually remember. I'm loafing around my apartment on a day off and happen upon one of the videotapes from that bag. This tape is a blank TDK or similar brand VCR cassette. On the top of the cassette, there's a white label with something written in pen. I don't remember exactly, but it said something like 60 minutes and some date, ending with the year 1993. I'd always been curious about what was on it, so I put it into one of the VCRs. The report that followed made my jaw drop. The report was a story done by 60 Minutes sometime in the 90s about the 1993 World Trade Center bombing, 
in the investigation to find those involved. It wasn't very remarkable until a picture of a certain videotape titled Children of Fire popped up on the screen. Part of the report stated that some of those involved in the bombings were inspired by the videos. Apparently, it was a documentary done by a Palestinian woman recording the training and fighting of the Palestinian state against Israel. This made my mind flip back to that day. Why in the world would a person own videotapes documenting attacks against Israel that inspired acts of terrorism against the United States and own multiple books about warfare, anti-Semitism, and the history of Nazis, only to throw them into the garbage mere days after a second attack of terrorism against the World Trade Center. I had my theory, but had I destroyed the evidence that could have helped implicate them as being involved in some way, or at least showed them as outright supporters of international terrorism? I broke out into a cold sweat at this thought. I had saved a couple of books in that videotape, but ran maybe 20 more books and tapes up into the truck. I had been almost catatonic for some time before my girlfriend came into the room and broke me free from my stupor. The following days were lived in a fog of regret. Then, not long after, it all came full circle. While listening to the news one afternoon in the truck, I was reminded of that little charity that had been closed around September 11th. A local self-proclaimed charity called the Holy Land Foundation, run by Palestinian Americans, were on trial for providing material support to Hamas and related offenses. To be more exact, the prosecution's theory was that the HLF distributed charity through local zakat, or charity committees, located in the West Bank that paid stipends to Palestinians who targeted Israeli civilians, or to their families if they ended their own lives during the act. That Hamas controlled those zakat committees and that by distributing charities through Hamas-controlled committees, HLF helped Hamas with the hearts and minds of the Palestinian people. By 2008, all the defendants had been found guilty on all counts. If you haven't got it yet, the freedom fighters shown in Children of Fire were part of Hamas. Hearing this report had transformed my guilt into utter terror. The odds were high that my partner and I had destroyed things while not really indicative of supporting terrorism certainly showed a blatant pro-militant attitude towards the state of Israel and those who were on their side. I didn't want to even consider the amount of problems we would have if this came out. Now, for the next four years, until the defendants from the Holy Land Foundation were convicted, I didn't want to have anything to do with any discussions pertaining to the Middle East. Their conviction would allay my fears and over time I would sell the books that I took that day. My mind would gradually move away from that miserable period. However, you can likely tell from this story that it hasn't completely disappeared from my subconscious mind. Within six weeks, I would receive a career-ending injury and my priorities would drastically change. As a wrap-up with this particular tale, I want to stress the fact that I did not then or now have any concrete proof that the owners of the house or the things in the bag belonged to anyone connected to the Holy Land Foundation. Nonetheless, if you were to put the recent happenings in the world and the fact that a local Palestinian charity was being arraigned for supporting terrorists, I'd wager 9 out of 10 Americans would have jumped to the same conclusion that I did. Now with this story complete, we move on to the next. Perhaps it will be the account of the clumsy trash man or... Maybe the tale of the man who yelled heart attack. Not even I know. Watch this space for the next post and bless you all for listening. Now for my next post and since we got to know one another a little, I'll shift the tone of our tale to something more life-changing, perhaps a tad gory for some. You've been warned. As you may imagine, the job of the classic garbage man can be dangerous at times. It's not uncommon to have five or more men out due to injury at any one time, a few more doing light duty in addition. The ways you can be hurt spans the spectrum. You can scratch a cornea one week, as I did, then suffer a heat stroke the next. I myself, in the almost three years working there, injured both knees, scratched both corneas, pinched nerves in both arms, and finally had the back injury that would ultimately end my career. 
it wasn't just me that suffered problems. Two men had heart attacks while on the job, and my own partner on a truck had a job-ending back injury a year prior to mine. Many of these accidents would happen to more than one man during their time throwing trash, but one specific, life-altering injury will likely occur only once. This accident was, and is still, the most horrid known among my former colleagues. At the time it happened, we were all fairly beat down from the summer heat, and several guys made small mistakes causing them to be injured. Until you work ten or more hours a day, four days, and sometimes five days a week, in the heat of a Texas summer, can you know how physically draining it can be. You can imagine how easy it is when you're worn out from a long, hot day of work to make stupid mistakes. Sometimes those mistakes can result in life-changing accidents. It was many hours into a shift when the news of the accident began being passed on the radio. Nobody knew at the time how bad it was or would ultimately be. No one but the two guys in the truck where it happened. I must first give you an idea of how the trucks work before I get more specific. On the back of the passenger side of our style of trucks are two handles. These handles allow you to open the scooper so it can come down and lift the trash into the storage area of the truck. If you need a better idea of what I mean, there are several good videos on YouTube available. On our older trucks, which we only had maybe half a dozen left, the handles cannot be run while the truck is moving. This was changed on the newer generation of trucks most of us drove. Often on a light day when we were in a hurry to get done and go home, we would clear the bucket on the move. This saved a lot of time. The two guys in that truck that day were doing exactly this when the accident happened. The guy on the back who was the one picking up the bags and running the handles would on occasion have to step off of the sidestep and onto the edge of the bucket to avoid things like low hanging tree limbs. And this is how it happened. From what we heard later, the guy on the back was running the bucket down between alleys. When the truck turned into the next one, he had to quickly step onto the edge of the bucket. Unfortunately, the scooper was already on its way down when he lost his footing and had his lower leg and ankle wedged between the edge of the scooper and the bucket. Naturally, he was in severe pain, but it was about to get worse, because it was clearly unable to think straight. Instead of grabbing and pulling on the handle to open the scooper, he mistakenly pushed against both handles, causing the scooper to curl under the trash in the bucket, pulling him deeper into it and crushing his legs even more. The driver told us the same day that despite having the radio cranked up, the windows also rolled up and the AC on max, he could hear his partner screaming clearly. The screaming got his attention immediately. When he looked over at the reverse camera, what he saw confused him at first. He said it was like he was being sucked into the back of the truck feet first, which in all reality, he actually was. He was waving his hands frantically as it happened. Even though he wasn't sure precisely what was occurring, it was obviously bad. He put the truck in neutral, set the brake, and ran to the back. When he could finally see what was going on, he said he almost started screaming himself. It must have been a terrible sight indeed. Running quickly to the passenger side, he pulled open the scooper and his partner's body dropped like a rock into the bucket. At first, the only sounds came from the idle of the truck, but a few seconds later... The guy started wailing again. His partner could see his ankle was twisted at an angle in his boot. Unsure of what to do, he asked the guy if he wanted him to take him into the service center or call an ambulance immediately. Of course, he yelled the word ambulance through his gritted teeth. So, that's what his partner did. He knew just as well as any of us that our boss would want him to bring the injured guy in instead, so he didn't call in until the ambulance showed up. The choice would be out of his hands then. With his partner out of action, he was told to return to the service center. This is where he was when I ran into him. The injured guy said the pain wasn't nearly as bad when it happened. The yelling and screeching was more a result of the shocking circumstances. However, by the time he'd made it to the ER, it was far worse. This is also when the results of his head striking the back of the truck first made itself known. It was determined later that day that he had a severe concussion in addition to the leg injury. When I visited him that evening, the doctors had yet to discover the full extent of the injury to the leg and foot. 
It wasn't until almost a year later when I spoke to his partner did I find out that he had almost lost his foot. Despite all the doctor's attempts, even after multiple surgeries, the damage was just too great, and they were unable to save it. I don't think any of us at the time, including the injured guy himself, realized how bad the injury was. Don't get me wrong, we were freaked out just hearing about it, but I don't think I know anyone that had that type of accident who's lost his foot because of it. It's possible I never grasped the magnitude of the injury. This may show through in the way that I've described it in this story, but like I said, I didn't witness it happen. Even when I visited him that night, almost his entire leg was wrapped up and under a blanket. From the day I found out about the loss, I focused as diligently as I could to not have anything like that happen to me. Even after it became clear that my back was too damaged for me to do any meaningful work again, I counted myself lucky to still have not turned out like him, and I continue to do so every day. That's about all I have for that one. I did my best to be as descriptive as possible while not being needlessly gory. Any of you out there with a good imagination were probably able to see it clearly. As a writer should be able to do enough with the fewest words, it serves you better in times such as ours especially. My next story is one of my favorites. While not quite as shocking as this one, it contains just enough of what you're all looking for. Whether it's days, weeks, or months, I'll be back with another tale for you. Just don't hold your breath. It can kill you. I think I picked this story as my favorite because despite it being terrifying at the time, we were able to laugh about it not long after. The fact that most of those reading and listening to these stories prefer darker and more shocking ones isn't lost on me. I'm one of you, actually. However, I'm also of the belief that we all need a lighter story once in a while. If we don't get them, the more shocking ones lose their punch. That's the number one reason I decided to include this story. Although it may not include a darker and sinister creature as its theme, I promise, if you'd been there with us, you would have been terrified. This story takes place not long before my final injury, maybe a few months. The year prior, my partner on the truck also had a back injury that would prevent him from returning to work. Since that time, I was rotated from truck to truck, mainly to pick up discarded items such as dishwashers and TVs. We had a small fleet of larger trucks fitted with the boom arm to pick up the bulk items and on that day we were helping with the smaller stuff. Because of the constant abuse suffered to them, it was common for one or two of the newer trucks to be in the shop. This was the main reason they kept a few of the older trucks around. Another reason was for jobs like the one myself and two of the other guys were doing that day. We all hated the older trucks. None had working ACs as far as I know. They could have just needed more Freon, but that was something that lazy bums in the shop didn't bother with. Another common malady was the brakes. When you're driving a machine that weighs over 26,000 pounds, you need good brakes. We had started the day with one old truck. Sometime after lunch, we noticed the flashing light on the back had stopped working, so we had to take it in and get another. By the time we got back out into our next stop, Everyone was finished for the day. We grabbed what was there and headed back to the service center to clock out. The trip back in, I was the one driving. Seeing as I'd gotten used to driving the trucks, I was very confident behind the wheel. I tend to have a lead foot in the car. This way of driving shifted to the trucks during work hours. I definitely was going too fast that afternoon. My eagerness to get home was my only excuse. Not far from the service center, there is an overpass connecting each side of town. The older trucks lacked the power the newer ones had, so I was going faster than normal to reach the top of the hill. Not far from the bottom of the hill was a stoplight. When I noticed it, I gradually began pushing on the brake pedal. I continued to push it until the pedal hit the floor. Unfortunately, the truck wasn't slowing down at all. Quickly realizing this and trying to fix it, I started pumping the brake. I was hoping it would build pressure in the line. Although it worked a little, it still wasn't enough. About this time was when the other two guys in the truck noticed. As we drew closer to the intersection, they yelled louder and louder to slow down. 
Obviously, I tried this without much result. All I could do was tell them to brace themselves for a possible crash. I swallowed the knot in my throat and began leaning into the horn. It didn't really work very well itself, but it did manage to squeak out an audible, be it weak, tone. Blasting through the red light, I switched my head left and right looking for any oncoming cars. Whether due to luck or divine providence, the way was clear and we made it through unscathed. Once we were parked and the truck shut down, a brief uncomfortable silence hung in the cab. Then, like as if on cue, all three of us let out a big gasp. It wasn't until we were back in the safety of HQ that we could finally feel relieved. We weren't even clocked out for the day, and we were already laughing about it. Human beings are strange like that. How we're able to laugh at our near death so quickly will always amaze me. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r Let's Read Official and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured in the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. Check out the Let's Read podcasts, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data. Located on both Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, taco, pickle, shrimps. I was hoping it would build pressure in the line. Pressure. Build pressure.